3D printing has rough surfaces. Some people like that look, some don't. In this video we don't like it. So let's fix it. To treat flat surfaces we were able to use ironing for ages now. So let's make use of that but introduce a third axis. Hi guys, I'm Roman from Tentech and let's talk about non-planar ironing. If we iron a layer, the nozzle slowly moves along the surface and remelts it, by sometimes extruding a tiny amount of additional material or by just using heat. I made a post-processing script that allows you to do that to curvy surfaces too, directly from within your favorite slicer and with your default nozzle. But there is more. It also supports the use of different tools for your tool changers. And of course, it's completely open source as usual. And if you use the right settings, you can also use it as non-planar top layer script. This is not a new concept. There are other publications around, like for example the one from ZHAW from my home country, where they deform the mesh before slicing and reverse it again. But for my use case, other methods just didn't quite give me enough control for my liking. Well, then let's look at my take on this topic. And oh boy, I think I exaggerated this time. Keep in mind that everything I explain from now on is calculated based on slice g-code commands. Which is probably the most time consuming way to do this, but I wanted it to work from within the slicer. So let's start at the beginning. We first start by rasterizing the surface relevant parts of the g-code to height fields at a certain resolution. We also build donor fields from internal segments to reconstruct hidden tops. While we sample the important lines of g-code we set small footprints around the sample so coverage isn't too sparse. Those then get moved with a box blur to reduce their stepping and noise. We also have the problem that sometimes top layers and other interesting parts of the g-codes are hidden under a slope. We can perform a gradulation to basically lift them up so the nozzle doesn't dig into the print to reach in areas. Then we apply a min filter to trim ridges. That basically gives us a good idea what the surface should look like. We can now compute slope gradients to get angles to decide where we want to apply the ironing. All that's left is to calculate the toolpath based on all that information but without the set axis for now. The result of all this is a flat layer of lines defining where to iron. When generating the Gco commands, we then calculate the set values. We do that here so that we can use bounds to contain them in a general area so that we can filter out small bugs. Okay, but we will be limited by the size of the nozzle, right? Nope. Other than in CNC milling, we can have cavities deeper than the tool length. But also, luckily, because we built a model up instead of taking material away, we can just split it in parts to process separately. This sounds easy, but there's a bit more to it. We can't just calculate segments based on the nozzle length because we, for example, can have overhangs which block cavities, and if the segmentation just happens to intercept with such geometry, it can't be reached. A fix for that is to calculate all the globally available regions to iron, then calculate the same but with collision detection and compare it. This gives us the problematic regions. We can then scan downward from the global top to create segments at the best possible height to account for all the possible ironing regions to be accessible with your nozzle length in mind. That's it. We now basically have a little cam with toolpath generation, collision detection and tool settings all inside a post-processing script calculated based on just G-code. Is it the best way to do it? Hell no. Do I do it this way because I don't want to read into slicer development? Absolutely. So let's throw it onto the printer and see what happens. In general it seems to look like it's supposed to do. I didn't quite get the settings perfect so far, because then this video would probably have taken another two weeks. And as the settings are highly individual, depending on your setup, you will have to find the perfect parameters by yourself anyways. But on the technical side, it seems to function, so I believe it's indeed possible to get way better results than what I have to show here. Using segments to split the model up also seems to be the right choice here, but the transitions could need some more work. Also, you can just use normal extrusion settings and use this as a non-planar top layer script, if you are looking for such functionality. But as you may have noticed by now, we have a huge limitation with our current nozzle designs. So the main takeaway is, let's get rid of the nozzle and its problematic geometry. The video from Yantek Engineering got me thinking about special ironing nozzles. In CNC milling, you're using ballpoint bits for finishing passes. This allows you to keep the same distance to the part in every direction. So why not do the same here? I had planned to machine a custom nozzle on my hobby lathe, but it seemed hard to make a good ball shape. Then a good friend of mine had the striking idea to just use an aluminum rivet because they already have a round end. So I went with that and drilled a hole in a cheap nozzle, disassembled the rivet and put it together. And voila, we have our very own ballpoint ironing nozzle. I intentionally made it very long so that we can reach down further. I then quickly threw together a CAD design and electronics for a custom tool holder attachment for one of my printers, because I don't own a tool changer. I'm currently using the exposed UART from the MMU2 plug and opened it up in the firmware for serial communication, to talk to a second printer board with a hotend and a stepper attached. I chose another dedicated printer board, because I then can use a customized Marlin version, which already handles stuff like, for example, thermal runaway protection and auto fan control. So my home doesn't burn down. Hopefully. 
This is surely not the most elegant way I could have chosen because it also introduces a slight communication delay between the boards, but I haven't found that to be a problem so far. For a more permanent setup, the best solution would probably be switching the printer board to a board that supports more axes and a second hotend slot. Anyways, I can now basically send Chico commands from the printer to the other board and it executes them normally to move the stepper and heat the hotend. Well, while this all sounds interesting, wait for next week where we attach a laser to this thing. So subscribe if you don't want to miss the next fire hazard. But now let's test this and pray that it works. Well, it didn't and I just found out about the horribly massive heat loss my custom nozzle has. I was expecting some amount of heat loss, but I certainly did not expect it to be 100 degrees Celsius. So back to the drawing board. This time I use a brass tube casing for a 1mm copper wire. The idea is to keep the hot copper away from the cool air and let it reach down into the ballpoint pin, which is a cut part from the previous rivet. Sounds like a good idea, but then again I'm not an engineer and I have no idea what I'm doing, so let's just find out. It was kind of a struggle to measure the offsets between the nozzle and the pin, but I somehow got it right now. In my opinion, it is mesmerizing to watch it, and I could spend the whole day like this. Which probably, judging by the wiring, would also be a good idea to do. But as cool as it looks, I'm not very happy with the ironing results. I'm pretty sure it just needs some more playing around with the settings and maybe also a pin redesign which allows for more heat transfer. Also, the script isn't perfect yet. But you have a lot of parameters to tweak. Literally every little step in the script from the pattern generation to the custom G-code generation is adjustable. I have planned to integrate wall ironing anyways, so I will surely spend some more time with this and find better parameters while doing that. I also encourage you guys to test this with your own tool changer printers and share your results. You will most definitely have a better accuracy than I can ever get with my custom setup. I think this may be a cool way to tackle the surface quality, especially if you have a tool changer. You can surely do a lot of fun stuff with custom tools, like in this case eliminating the problematic nozzle shape. And I can imagine that in future many cool custom use cases for tool changers will get more popular as more and more such printers get put to market nowadays. But unfortunately, that's all I have for you today. An install and usage guide will soon follow in another video, but you can look at the code on GitHub in the meantime. I will also continue testing and spending more time printing so that I hopefully can share better results. The script is far from perfect, but I kept adding and adding and adding stuff that came to my mind. If I wouldn't make it public now, it would probably go on like this forever. This was quite a lot of work and easily the most complicated script I made so far. So make sure to comment, like, share and subscribe if you want to boost my algorithm and support me that way. I also now have a Patreon page, so if you want to support projects like this financially, you can do it there. Now stay tuned for the next video where we play with lasers on this setup. And make sure to check out my other work like for example non-planar interlocking walls, top layer and overhang fuzzy skin or adaptive layer height with constant wall resolution. If you haven't seen them already of course. If you want to, you can share your testing results on GitHub or in my subreddit. But now, thank you for watching and happy printing!